would say that in these times, the first goal of any business is to remain in business. However, remaining in business is not a static position. The challenge is to continue to continuously grow and transform. With today's rate of business disruption, led by innovation, business growth has become very critical. Therefore, the primary task of today's CEO is to lead her, his or her firm not only by making it profitable, but ensuring its sustenance, profitability, and growth tomorrow. In a world where tomorrow continues to be a shrinking time frame, the CEO has become an endangered species, and he or she needs all the help she can get in his or her, her quest to build a sustainable and profitable business enterprise. The task of a CEO can be made easier when the rank and file in the organization know where the organization is headed and are aware of the skills that are required to produce that corporate destination. While he or she may be responsible for defining that destination, it is abundantly clear that the task of executing on this journey lies in the hand of all levels of leadership within the enterprise. This has to be spelled out clearly in the organization's learning and development strategy. Now, what is learning and development? Learning and development aims to improve knowledge and skills of the workforce and align goals and performance on an individual and team level with the corporate objective. The key is to identify skill gaps among groups and teams and then find relevant training to fill these gaps. It is important that these skill gaps, skills gaps and proposed learning and development strategy are very much in sync with the corporate business objectives. There must be a link with the bottom line. Learning has become more of a strategic driver of competitive advantage and market value. Now, why is learning and development so important? According to the American Association of Talent Development, organizations are more competitive, agile, and engaged when knowledge is constantly and freely shared, democratized learning. In a survey of 830 companies in 2015, the association found that organizations with a culture of learning were some of the highest performers. They also found that they attracted more talent, more talented employees, and had higher levels of customer satisfaction. A LinkedIn research showed employees to be more productive when employers provide employees with opportunities for continuous learning. This helps them continue to improve their skills, be more flexible and adaptable, especially in the face of technological changes in learning. When continuous learning is valued, employees feel wanted, helping boost employee engagement and retention. This attribute is even more important now with the millennials and the Generation Z employees, who I believe are the most problematic today. For these new employees who are used to an on-demand lifestyle, accessibility has become a way of life and the workplace doesn't need to be different for them. So good training and development programs play a role in staff retention. This is very clear and imminent. In these highly competitive times, employee training and development programs have become more important than ever and the cultivation of talented employees right from onboarding to deployment will significantly impact business growth. According to 2017 Workplace Learning Report, 69% of L&D professionals say that talent is the number one priority in their organization. And over a quarter are expecting a budget increase in 2017 for L&D programs. According to China Goman, the CEO of a company called Great Place to Work, as companies grow and the war for talent intensifies, 
it is increasingly important that training and development programs are not only competitive, but are supporting the organization on its defined strategic path. And it's not just about retention. Employee training and development programs directly impact your bottom line. There are a few steps to developing a training plan. The first is to propose a business impact. And in doing that, you have to design your training to meet the company's overall goals. Keeping business goals in focus ensures training and development creates a measurable impact. Everything stems from the expected business impact. Number two, pinpoint skill gaps. A detailed appraisal process helps determine exactly what the skill gaps in an organization are Find, by finding out what the gaps are between employees' current and ideal skills. You can accurately determine what the learning objectives should be, what the preferred learning methods are, and ultimately what the appropriate forum should be. Here are the three areas that training activities should focus on. Subsection one, motivation. Attitude determines altitude, they say. Some would argue that this is intrinsic and cannot be learned, or that the workplace isn't the place to modify people's behavior. Actually, the right motivation makes technical learning easier. Number two, technical mastery. It is important for employees to gain technical mastery of their job and to acquire skills that would prepare them and the business for growth and new development in their industry. Number three, critical thinking. What must your learners know to perform their jobs well? You must be able to distinguish critical knowledge from nice to know information to identify what content should be in the course and what should be in optional resources. Now, the third item in developing a training plan is what I would call layer training methods. The most effective training programs use layered sustainable learning activities to create performance improvement over time. A layered approach makes sure your program targets the essential employee and business needs while training the right people at the right time in the right way. A layered, a layered approach is the best of all worlds because it blends learning experience and training methods. The fourth is evaluating effectiveness and sustained gains. Employees' training must not be limited to classroom experiences. They must be embedded into the day-to-day -day tasks. Measurable learning objectives are important to evaluate learning impact. The feedback from this evaluation would help determine where gaps still exist and what future training needs may arise. Now, in terms of benefits, the benefits of employee training. Companies invest in training programs because they expect the investment to pay off for the individual, for their teams, and of course the organizational benefits. Now, if we look at the organization, what are the benefits we derive from investing in training? Of course, you expect improved profit. You expect improved staff retention, of course, reduced staff turnover. You expect, of course, deeper talent succession pipelines because you're able to develop people internally. For the individual, what are the benefits? Increased motivation, the person is probably more, motiv more motivated to work. Improved engagement because they can actually discuss intelligently, they can apply themselves better. And of course, improved speed to competency and productivity. You know, an average individual feels that he goes for training and the benefit is actually for him and him alone. But he doesn't realize that in the process of doing his or her job, it actually improves the organization as a whole. Now, what are the roles of a, I call it an L&D lead? I won't call it an L and D head or you know the conventional word. What are the roles? There are three very important things that someone handling L and D should 
expect to do. One, they help the chief executive build the talent and capability required to effectively execute corporate strategy. So what that clearly means is that you have to have a clear idea of what your organization's corporate strategy is. So you must be able to read between the lines and understand your CEO's direction. And don't forget, a lot of CEOs do not, everything doesn't come out from their mouth. Their expression, their body language, you must know when or what your CEO expects from you. You must know what your CEO's thought process is about almost everything. Number two, they help drive, of course, share prices, if you are listed, in the right direction by enhancing corporate performance and growing the organization's ability to create stronger customer relationship. So what that tells you is that you have responsibility for figures. So it's not just about putting people in classrooms and saying that, oh, I have trained so many, so and so number of people. For the CEO, what is the bottom line? I'm responsible to shareholders, so I need to know if I invest 100 million on training, I must actually know where value is going to come from, whether in Naira and Kobo, or whether in perceived value. Third, you help to deliver, you help the CEO deliver his exceptional performance. Any right-thinking CEO that does not, sorry, every right-thinking CEO must recognize that his biggest and most critical success factor for his organization is his workforce, or what we call our human resource. And the minute you stop doing that, you start digging your grave. Now, what are the expectations of the CEO from my perspective? Number one, I must be able to see visible utilization of the skills learned on the job. So I send you on training and you come back, I must be able to start seeing the impact. Because if I don't see the impact, that means I haven't seen value. Number two, computation of the ROI on L&D must be very basic and must show business contribution. Meaning that, you know, you could go to business schools and come back and, you know, I want to see what is the return on the investment I have made on somebody. Conventionally, unfortunately, organizations lay emphasis on trainings relevant to levels. So, for instance, I became a DGM in a bank. It is statutory that when you become a DGM in a bank, you go for AMP in INSEAD. So, automatically you go to INSEAD for four weeks, enjoying the warmth of a very nice, beautiful village in France, and drinking red wine and eating that they are dry bread, this French bread. And you come back, how is that value of about 30,000 euros, how is it converted to value for the organization? So because I'm a DGM, that is what entitles me to do. So it's become a benefit as against value. So you must be able to show me, I'm sending you on training. I must be able to easily say that when this person comes back, either of two things, his productivity would increase via the increased efficiency on his job, which would translate to increased turnover, or his productivity would increase as a result of him being able to understand how to sell more, and of course, my turnover would increase. Number three, clear articulation of connection to business. Meaning that you must be able to relate every trading proposal to the business that we run. Whether short, medium, and long term. Number four, you must be able to develop learning scorecards for executives to drive executive involvement. You know, I've learned through my career what I call leadership by example. If you want something done, you have to lead by example. You have to show example. 
I've had a culture of starting my day early all my life. I'm in my office, I'm on my desk at 7.30 for 30 years. And unfortunately, I can't stop. So naturally, all my colleagues too, they have, forced, they have been forced to align. Not by force, but of course, when your CEO is in the office by 7.30, even if your resumption time is 9, you think that, okay, what if the guy needs something at 8 o'clock? He'll be calling me and I'll probably be in bed. So you must be able to develop a learning scorecard for executives. Because, you see, it's a contributory responsibility that every executive has. But what happens is that we tend to just, you know, leave the executives out of the learning and development process. And once you miss the executives, it's not just the CEO. It is everybody at senior management responsible. So you must involve them. There must be some sessions where you challenge your executives to come and go through a training process. So for instance, with us, every staff coming in will be subjected to an induction, a three-day induction program. And that induction program is always kicked off by me to define the vision of the organization. Subsequently, my colleagues in senior management also takes different sessions. So develop a learning scorecard for them and let the people that have been trained start measuring your executives. What that does is that it makes them more responsible. And even for me as the CEO, my responsibility is even easier because everybody is able to, of course, catch the bug and understand the vision of the organization. Computing the learning costs per hour per level model. What I'm saying is simple. I must be able to know what the cost of ownership of every level of staff I have. So meaning that whoever it is I'm investing in, I must be able to know that this is the amount this person is costing me per hour, inclusive of the cost of training. Now, conclusively, a wise man once said that if you think hiring someone, training them, and having them leave is expensive, try hiring them, not training them, and having them stay. And you just have a bunch of monkeys. It is important to remember that the most important asset a company has are its people. A people who are not well trained, to produce the best outcomes for the organization will eventually create a subpar organization. You know, I tell my colleagues that we don't want to be a successful organization. A successful organization is an organization that thinks outside the box. I'm sure you agree with me, right? You're looking confused. We don't want to be a successful organization because a successful organization is one that thinks outside the box. Am I correct? You are following me? What we want to be is an exceptional organization. And an exceptional organization is an, ex an organization that thinks as if there is no box. When you have an ambition, when you have an ambition to be successful, when you aim for a hundred percent, what do you score? For those of you that left school in the last five, ten years, you probably scored 95, 90, 80, then they give you let my people go, as we call it in the university in those days. But when you aim for a hundred and fifty percent, what happens? You get 120. So aim for something way over and above what you want to achieve. So don't aim to be successful. You are a failure if you are just successful. Aim to be exceptional. Now, most CEO roles are occupied by a former COO, a former CFO, a former CIO, a former CMO. I'm sure you know what all those things mean. The CIO is the chief information officer who has responsibility for driving innovation and technology. 
the chief, the CMO is the chief marketing officer, the CFO is the chief financial officer, the COO is the chief operating officer. If you look at all the successful organizations, all organizations generally, those are the people you find holding the role of a CEO. I was once a COO. Now, it's therefore imperative that a C-suit role is created. And that role would be known as a CLO, a Chief Learning Officer. Who would, like other colleagues, have the potential of becoming the CEO of the organization and would better understand the value and importance of human resource? Unfortunately, I'm talking to the wrong crowd, but I hope you get this message across to your CEOs in terms of succession planning. Because it's very, very important we all understand this. Now, another thing I also see is that over time, other HR roles would or could over time be outsourced to other functions and companies. What I'm saying there is simple. You have three, four departments under HR. You have recruitment, you have payroll administration, you have learning and development. What else do you have apart from that? Sorry? Performance management and all those things. Now, from a CEO's perspective, all I think of is increasing efficiency, right? Performance, can I outsource it, yes or no? Yes, I can. I can outsource it. In terms of the measurement, I'll just get the company to come and do the performance review. Abi? Payroll, can I outsource it, yes or no? Um, what's the other one? Sorry, recruitment is already outsourced today, so now, but when you now look at learning and development, do you have potentials of outsourcing it? Can you outsource the training of your children? Can you outsource the training of your children? Unfortunately, a lot of us have outsourced it to house help, so they understand the culture of the house helps. And I keep saying it, you women have outsourced a lot of your roles. But the issue is, L and D, it's probably one of the only roles you cannot outsource. And what would happen is that as technology and innovation evolves over the next few years, what would happen is that every other role would get outsourced. But L and D is what would remain. Which is why I'm proposing that over time, organizations should start creating a C-suit level to responsibility where you have a chief learning officer who would have the same possibilities and prospects of becoming the CEO of an organization. On that note, I'll say thank you for listening. An awesome, awesome presentation. You'll agree with me that Mr. Shego has touched on very critical topics. And I know while I sat there, I could literally see questions bubbling in the hearts of some people. My name is Lamide Tao. Uh, I work with FedEx. Um, it is actually not a question, but I just wanted you to expand on um, the scorecard, learning scorecard for executive. I, I think from my own understanding, it makes more, a lot of, I mean, more involvement in terms of um, trading activities. So, so if you can just expand on that, I appreciate it. Thank you. My name is Roswell from Friesland Campina Wanko. Um, during your address, you said something about the succession of people becoming CEOs. So most times it's either the CFO or the CIO and that. But over time, I don't know, I may not be wrong because I do not have any facts or figures. But over time, it's, we rarely see HR directors moving into the role of CEOs or anyone from the HR department moving into the role of CEO and with um, artificial intelligence and all of that happening, the whole disruption in the digital world, um, HRO is risking being outsourced generally. So why do you think, because now you are a CEO, why do you think over time it is not um, possible for the HRO to you know, succeed into the role of being a CEO and what can we do now to change that? Thank you. I've learned something very uh, uh, new today. I think 
as if there is no box so that you can be exceptional. My name is Lucky. I'm from Stambik IBTC. I actually, uh, area of interest, um, learning and development in the world of uh, robotics where everything will be at source or things will be replaced by robot robotics. Now, I want to find out because you just said something that catch my uh, attention and my interest that um, almost every area in, in human resources will be assessed, except learning and development. But before now, I've been thinking that learning and, develop, uh, learning and development is the first thing that will be assessed because of uh, automation, technology, and some other things. So please, I just want you to throw more light so that I can now try to think in a different direction. Thank you very much. I tell my colleagues that they are paid to think and paid to approve. So I tell you what I want and it's your business to go and do it. I've told you my idea. All I want is I want HR to be able to measure executives. Now, you do balance call cards in your organization. Take it as a prototype and build something around what you expect from executives in terms of contribution, in terms of value, in terms of impact, in terms of feedback. So I can't tell you that I have a solution. I come up with the problem is for you to solve. So go back, think through it. And if you can, if you want to patent it, I will be involved in it because I must get returns from it. So I would advise you go back. It's something you can easily put together. You just need to probably think a bit deeper and start thinking like someone thinking outside the, as if there's no box, not outside the box. Because that is a thought outside the box. Now, no HR is becoming CEO. What I said was actually in support of the fact that HR officers and leads should have better opportunity to become the CEO. And my own thought process is very simple. Um, for instance, when you're in banking, they say if you don't know how to manage time, which is why the number one thing for me in my organization is discipline with time. So if I say a meeting holds at 7 a.m., by 7 a.m., if I'm seated, it will be a big taboo for you to walk in. As a matter of fact, you probably hate yourself and regret even walking in. Because discipline is important. So, and there's an equation I draw. Time is equal to what? Money. If you put manage in front of time, you also have to put manage in front of money. So, if you can manage time, it will be equal to... And if you do a not equal to sign, and you say, if you can't manage time, what happens? And if you can't manage money, you are not... Actually, you are not supposed to be in my organization. It's as simple as that. So for me, I think someone that has built skills in understanding people. Because to do learning and development, there's something called frame of reference. I learned that in my MBA class. For you to manage any human being well, you must understand the person's frame of reference. And what is the frame of reference? The thought process of that person. Because if you don't understand people's frame of reference, how can you know how to relate to them? How, how do you know how to deal with them? So for me, I strongly believe that as we go along, a lot of um, jobs are going to be outsourced. A lot of roles are going to be outsourced. But the truth is you have to make yourself relevant. And don't think you can be relevant managing payroll for 20 years. Don't think you can be relevant going around and doing um, all these other non-value adding, outsourceable, if there's any word like that, outsourceable roles. Better start realigning yourself and repositioning yourself. It is not about playing politics. It's about being strategic. And it's not just about HR. Every role in any kind of organization Look, I was talking to someone yesterday, and I said, there's a company that is researching how to use the sensor on your phone to actually do a blood test. 
So what would happen is that the same way for those of you that use biometrics on your phone. So just punch your finger and put that finger, place it on the sensor and you can do your full blood count that you go to hospitals to do. So what happens? The laboratory technicians in the hospital, you fire them. They've lost their jobs. They've become irrelevant. How many of you buy tickets? That's the most ridiculous one. How many of you buy tickets uh, through an agent? How many? You don't need it. There is travel right. Uh, travel, I think it's travel right. Because the way I do my own, I go to travel right. I first look for the cheapest. Then I'll now get it and I'll go to the airline and go and buy my ticket. Why do you need a travel agent? So you have to think differently to be able to get the kind of resource you want. Now, why won't learning and development or why, why is learning and development not outsourced? Did I get your... So, sorry. Oh, okay. No, 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 no. You see, I go back to the earlier point I made. If you don't understand people's frame of reference, you don't understand their thought process, you'll be a failure in managing them. For those of you that have children, you cannot have two children with strikingly similar attributes. It's not possible. So, would you behave to one the same way you behave to the other? So the same way too, when you are developing people's talent, you have to understand their frame of reference. Because if you don't understand their frame of reference, there is no way you can relate with them efficiently. And my point is that when you understand that, understand that from the perspective of business, there is no better person than a CLO to take over the role of a CEO. It's just as simple as that. Thank you.